Good morning, church. Glad to see you all this morning. If I haven't met you before, my name is Jacob Burson, community pastor here at Sam Jones Methodist. Glad y'all chose to worship here with us today. If you're a first time guest with us today, a special welcome to you again. Glad that you're here with us. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. We'll get you connected in the right places. If you're watching and listening online, good morning to you as well. Just have a few announcements to share this morning. Again, uh, pass the attendance pads at the end of each row and fill those out as you feel led at this time. Again, just two announcements today. On Sunday, September the 1st, on Labor Day weekend, we will only have, we'll have two services that Sunday. We'll have a 9 a.m. modern worship service across the street, and we will have our traditional worship at one time here that Sunday at 11 a.m. So 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., two services on Sunday, September the 1st. <clears throat> We are asking our Sunday school classes to meet at 10 a.m., but we also have an opportunity at 10 a.m. Uh, for a meet and greet over in the Family Life Center on the kids' floor to meet our new children's director, David Bedsworth. So again, uh, two services on sun Sunday, September the 1st, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and uh, 10 a.m. Sunday school classes or a 10 a.m. meet and greet uh, with David Bedsworth, our new children's director. One last announcement to share. Our Bible studies will begin on Wednesday, September the 4th. If you go to the church website, our registration and signups for that are live there uh, on our registration page. You can register at any time. There's also information that was found in the bulletin today. We have a lot of different ways that you can sign up for those Wednesday night uh, gatherings. Uh, we're going to talk about community today in the service, and that's a good chance and a good opportunity to grow together as a church around um, small groups uh, on Wednesday nights here. So again, that's going to kick off on September the 4th and signups are live now on the church website. Uh, there's a lot going on in the life of the church. If you look at the bulletin, you'll see uh, that there's not as, quite as much blank space this week. Uh, that just shows that there's a lot going on. So there's a, a lot of life here in this place. Let us know. Please let us know. Call the office if you have any questions. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Lord is with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God, we come together today as a community of believers. We are so grateful that your spirit is present here with us today. Lord, in our time that we are together, we pray that you lead us in harmony and grace. Lord, remind us in this time of worship that we gather uh, with believers all across the globe who are worshiping in many different ways in many different places. And we are grateful to be a part of this community of faith. Lord, lead our time. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with me our first hymn, hymn 388, The Church's One Foundation. Hymn 388. Let's stand as we sing.
I invite you to remain standing as we confirm our affirmation of faith. It's also printed in the bulletin. I ask you this morning, church, what do you believe? I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker, maker of heaven and, heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts, acknowledging all the blessings that you've given us in our lives. As we present these gifts and offering today, I pray that we do so with joy and thanksgiving, recognizing all that you've given us. Lord, use these gifts to further your kingdom, to spread your love, and to support those in need. Lord, bless the hands that give and the hearts that receive. Guide us to be good stewards as a church, and may this be a testament to your grace, to your generosity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
I'd like to invite our children forward for a moment of children's time. While they do that, please greet one another. Good morning, friends. So good to see all of you. All right, we're going to do something today that's a little different. So I'm going to get y'all all to come sit right here so you can see me. Okay? We all, all come sit right here. I want you to see what we're talking about today. Yeah, sit down right there so that you can look at me and see me. we got a great group here today. Okay, so how many of you know what this is? It's not a trick question. It's a cup, right? Yeah, it's a cup. Nothing in it, nothing, nothing fancy, right? How would you describe this cup? Well, how would you describe it? Red cylinder. That's pretty good. That's, that's really good. Any, anything else? <laughs> Say it again. It kind of looks like an ice cream cone. Yeah, if I were to put some ice cream in it, it would be great, wouldn't it? Sorry, there's no ice cream in it. See, you can see it. Anything else? How would you describe it? Would any of you describe it as strong? No, that's not the word that we would think of. What if I told you, though, I could get a cup like this, if I can get these solo cups to hold me up? Do you think it could, it could work? Nah, that was pretty strong. You don't think it'll hold me up? <laughs> All right, what do you think? What if I told you I can, I can make this work? So let's see. This is why I want y'all to sit right there. You think it can hold me up? Y'all yeah. don't have any faith in me, do you? <laughs> or you don't have faith in this cup. You think it'll work? All right, let's see. Oh. Well, hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. Hold on. Wait a second. All right. I got another one. Let's try it again. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Now do you trust me? No. Oh. Let's see. Oh. Uh, one more. One more. One more. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. <laughs> see what I got here? No, it's, it's a cup, right? So what happens if I carefully put it down? I practice without a stole on. Okay, now do you think it can hold me? I'm not going to jump. Can I have one person come hold, help me? Come help me real quick. Hold, hold my hand so I don't fall. All right, you think it can hold me? No. I didn't eat breakfast this morning, so it would work. It's holding me up. What do I want you to learn? One cup by itself couldn't stand strong. Right? But when all the cups work together, when they're united by this board here, they do. The same is true for us. That's what we're talking about with the adults. Is that together we're better, right? When we stay together in Jesus, we can hold strong. When we're by ourselves, the things of the world can crush us. Okay? So stay together. You're stronger together when you're united in Jesus. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the family that you have given us here at the church. Continue to bind us together in the name of your son, Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. I'm going to stay here the rest of the day. Let's see if I can get off of it carefully. It worked. Maybe afterwards. Maybe afterwards. The power of that glue. <laughs> glue. I was praying fervently. <laughs> Thank you. And that should teach all of us a great lesson. I love that. As the children continue their time together, I invite you to stand and sing with me hymn 405, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Hymn 405. Let's stand as we sing.
Please be seated. Join me as we go to this God in this time of prayer. God, we come to you today asking for your presence to be with us, knowing that you are already with us. Lord, we lift up our world to you, a world that needs peace and hope, in a world that we see so much conflict and natural disasters and forest fires and poverty and hunger. Oftentimes it can feel overwhelming, but we trust that you are greater than all these things. We pray for healing where there's brokenness, where calm where there is chaos. We pray for provision where there is lack. We, we pray for protection for those who are facing natural disasters and those effects, those who are caught in the path of fires and flood and storms. God, be their refuge and strength. For those struggling with poverty and hunger, Lord, we ask that you meet their needs and help us, guide us, your church, to be your hands and feet in serving them. God, we also lift up those who are sick, those who are sick and suffering, whether that be in body, uh, in mind, or in spirit. Lord, surround them and us with your healing presence. And Lord, remind us all that nothing is impossible with you. Lord, may they feel your comfort and peace in their darkest moments. And may we feel it as well. Lord, guide our church. Guide our church to be a beacon of compassion and of love to the community that you've placed us in. Help us to serve others with a smile on our face. Help us to serve joyfully. Help us to live out our faith in ways that make a real difference for your kingdom work. Lord, as your word often reminds us, spur us on to love and good works, knowing that we do that better together that we can't do it on our, own, on our own. We can't do it alone, we can't do it on an island. God, remind us to come together, and then when we do show up together, that you are leading us to good works. Or be with us as we go out into the world this week. Help us to be a light in the darkness, showing your love in every situation, to every people, and every place that we find ourselves. Lord, we trust you with our lives, we trust you with our church, and we trust you in our world. And God, we come to you now with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, good morning, Sam Jones Methodist Church. It is always so wonderful to be here in the house of the Lord with you. He certainly is worthy to be praised, and it is good to do that today. Uh, Being our our last sermon in August and this being kind of the last Sunday of our Being Sam Jones initiative, I wanted to bring it up to you one more time. Hopefully this is the fourth time you've heard me tell you about it. If it is the first, I'll give you the short version. The long version is at the beginning of the first sermon in August. So if you really want to hear all that, go and listen to that. It should be on Facebook, YouTube, all of those wonderful places. But in your bulletin, hopefully you found this insert where we are challenging you. I am challenging you. Hopefully we're challenging each other to be the church. My sincere desire for us as a church is that from the very moment someone walks onto our church property for the very first time, they hear and see the gospel proclaimed at every moment. That they find somebody at the door smiling and welcome them into the house of the Lord. That when they drop their children off in the children's area, they see a smiling face at every moment. Sure, from the pulpit, I hope that the gospel is proclaimed, but I hope it's proclaimed well before that. And so this is an opportunity to invite you into the work of telling people about Jesus. We, we've talked about it takes 86 people, not 86 a Sunday, but that's 86 people who choose to serve in one area once a month to make Sunday mornings happen well. And so we invite you, encourage you to be a part of this. This is something we're going to do about once a year so that there's an easy on-ramp, an easy off-ramp if your life changes. Checking a box is not a life sentence uh, if, if circumstances change for you. But it's a way that you can make an impact and a difference on people. I, I told you I'd give you updates on numbers. 86, again, is what we've been trying to shoot for. Uh, so far, we've had 70 inserts turned in. Now, a few of those are for Wednesday service opportunities, which is great. We need those as well. Um, For for Sunday morning, though, if I did my math correctly, uh, we needed 26 more to reach our goal. Now, we've already had two services and have had a good many turned in, uh, so we don't need necessarily 26 from this service, but hopefully you, you have already turned one in or you're prayerfully considering doing that Uh, You've been able to put those in the offering plate. We've already taken up the offering. So if you want to, while I'm preaching, fill that out. It's the one time I'll let you fill something else out while I'm preaching, right? Um, Feel free to leave those on the altar on your way out. Stop by the office. We'll be here all week. Uh, If you've got any questions, come by and see us. But we thank you for for taking seriously uh, this call to, to be the church. Uh, This is, again, being the last month or last Sunday in August is the end of our return series. This has been a season where we've considered what it means to return. Everything else in our life is returning, right? We're back to school. We're back to routines. College football started back on uh, yesterday, I guess it was. Uh, We don't talk about the teams that were involved, that ugly yellow team across the pond that played. Um, But but it's back, right? It was actually a really good game. Well, if you're a Florida State fan, it wasn't good. But uh, it was uh, an interesting game to watch. Things are back to normal. Even this week, Wednesday night supper's returned. And if you've not been invited to that, come and join us on Wednesdays for a time of great food and fellowship. Pastor Jacob told us that our Bible studies on Wednesday night are almost back. There's a lot of returning going on. And so I have challenged you and I hope you have taken seriously this calling for us to think about what it would look like for us to return in our spiritual lives. What it would look like for us to return to God. Uh, we may not think about that all the time and and so if we take stock what we often will find is that we're a little bit further from God than we realized we were and so I want you to return back to God. Uh, We've looked at what that means right we know that if we're going to return to God we've got to turn from our sin we can't serve two masters and hopefully you've taken that seriously and then the, the back half of this series I've wanted us to focus on some spiritual practices spiritual disciplines that if we will return to them, they'll help us in our quest to return to God. So last week was prayer. I hope that you are praying seriously and taking that serious. But this week I want us to look at another practice that on face value doesn't seem like a spiritual practice, doesn't seem like a spiritual discipline, but I think is deeply so. It is the practice of community. I think if we are going to return to God, we have to return to one another. So to do that, I want us to turn to our scripture for this morning. If you've got your Bibles with you, or if you plan to use the Pew Bibles, I invite you to open to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be reading from the 10th chapter, starting at verse 19 and reading through verse 25. 
Let us join together as we listen to and read God's word. Hear now this reading from the book of Hebrews, which tells us this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed pure. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day. And we thank you for this time that you have set aside that we might gather and worship. Lord, we come to you with expectant hearts. We ask, O Lord, that you meet us here. That you speak to us your story of life and of grace. That we might come to look more like you. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to start with a question this morning that maybe you've asked yourself, but maybe not. Why are you here this morning? At first it may seem like an easy answer. We're here to worship God, right? I hope and and pray that that is your answer. It's at least the standard boilerplate answer. If I came out with a microphone and asked you why you're here, I assume that would be your response. Don't worry, I won't do that. But be honest with yourself for a moment, because if you won't be, who will? Be honest with yourself, be honest with God. Why are you here? Well, we're here because it's Sunday. It's what we do. Get up and get dressed, come to worship, go to lunch. We did it last week, do it this week, we'll probably do it next week. That's the answer for some of us, if we're being honest. For others, we're here to not ruffle any feathers. What I mean by that is you have been brought here to church by someone. You wouldn't have necessarily picked it, but they asked if you'd come. They told you you were going to go, right? And and so you're here because you don't want to start an argument, but every now and then you might kind of look down and see if it's noon yet, right? Right? I'll be honest, there, there's or many of us here, and, and that's the reason, okay? Let's, let's be honest. Ask yourself, why are you here? The author of Hebrews hopefully begins to help us try to think through that answer. If you've never thought about that before, he begins to give us some answers. And if we look at the scripture for today, he starts with this. And this must be the baseline to any answer we give on why we are here. The author of Hebrews tells us that we are here because of what Jesus did. That's the whole first part of our scripture there. The author wants to desperately remind us that we are here because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That Jesus came, lived, and offered himself so that we might receive forgiveness from our sin if we will draw near to him and profess our hope and faith in him. You would not be here if it was not for Christ. You would not be here if it was not for what Jesus did for you. We are here because Christ has opened up a way that we might come to the Holy of Holies and see the face of God in this place. We are here because he has washed us clean by the blood of the Lamb. That's why we sang earlier that he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy because of what he has done for me and for you. If we forget that, If the first part of our answer to why we are here does not start with that, we have missed the point. But the author goes on. In light of what Jesus has done for us, there's another reason why we are here this morning. As we hold unswervingly to our faith in Christ, we gather in this place so that we might encourage others who profess the same hope. To spur one another on in love and good deeds, the scripture says. 
We're here to worship. We're here to be reminded of who Jesus is. And we are here to remind others who Jesus is. Like so many things, I think I mentioned it last week, right? It can come to the the greatest commandment that Jesus talks about in the gospel. If you want to boil it down, there's a lot of nuance there. But if you want an easy answer, it's this. That we're here to love God and we're here to love others. You can't do one without the other. If you don't believe me, I can give you what I think is a pretty good rationale for it. What if I told you that the word saint was used in the New Testament 67 times? That may not surprise you. We think of that as a church word. We think of that as a word we would find in Scripture. This New Testament idea of a saint, right? Someone who's been called by God to be a part of the body of Christ. Someone who has been set aside as a follower of Jesus, right? It's used 67 times in the New Testament. That's really not that interesting. What's interesting, though, is that when it's used 66 out of 67 times, the word is plural. And for my English nerds out there, the 67th time is actually a collective noun, So it's singular, but it's referring to one group of multiple people. You cannot be a follower of Jesus on your own. You cannot do this alone. If you want to try and follow Jesus by yourself, I would argue that you need to wonder whether or not you're actually following Jesus. Some have tried. Many have tried. Even 2,000 years ago in the writing of this passage, right? The author says, don't give up meeting together like some people have gotten in the habit of doing. Even then, he was trying to argue, you cannot do this by yourself. If you want to return to God, you have to return to one another. Easier said than done. People are difficult, right? It's tough. But it's that to which God has called us. So what does it mean for us to be together? What does it mean for us to return to one another? What does it mean for us to engage again in this spiritual practice of community? Well, the author does give us some help. Describes this as spurring one another on toward love and good deeds. Other translations, if you have them with you, might say stirring one another on towards that. Whatever your Bible translates it as, it's the Greek word perousimos. And the normal use for this word is when it's talking about any time that there's been a sharp disagreement amongst people. The only other time, in fact, that it's used in the New Testament, you go to the book of Acts, it's used to describe a a, a rift within the church. It's used to talk about when someone has been incited or stirred up in their emotions. If we tried to think of a word today, we might would use words like annoyance or disturbance. Stir one another up, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. What that means is this. As brothers and sisters in Christ, it is your job to annoy one another to Jesus. Yes, I'm giving you permission to be annoying. That might sound strange, but it's true. Think about your own siblings, if you've had those in your lifetime, a brother or sister. What's the key task of a sibling? It's to annoy the other siblings, right? If my sister's watching, I mean that. A long car ride, what's a sibling there to do? To poke at the other one until they just explode with frustration or to the parents get involved. You're supposed to be the annoying little brother or little sister, maybe even the annoying big brother or big sister. And that is what the family of Christ should look like, annoying one another to Jesus. We should know each other so intimately well that we're familiar with each other's struggles and desires, those things that keep us from Jesus. And as someone who loves you, I should berate you and annoy you We might call that hold you accountable. I should berate you and annoy you so that you might grow closer to Jesus. Are you following Jesus? 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 Are you still addicted to that sin? 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 
Are you still pursuing Christ? 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 The body of believers should look like a group of people that are fighting like siblings who push one another's buttons but ultimately know that they do so in love because growth doesn't happen in the comfortable places. Growth happens in those difficult places that often family push us through. This is your family. The body of Christ is your family in Jesus. If we can't quibble and fight and annoy one another, who can? But you can only do that when you know the intimate details of their lives that come through time spent together. That's the image that Hebrews gives us. And luckily for us, as Methodists, this is built within our DNA It's easy for us to forget it, but this is what our movement was built upon. These intimate, personal, relational communities. John and Charles Wesley, often known as the founders of the Methodist movement, they first got a taste of this when they were students at Oxford College in London. If you've been through a membership class with me, this might start to ring some bells. They started this thing called the Oxford Holy Club. It was a group of eight or nine men who gathered together and wanted to pursue Jesus at the same time. So they met regularly. They prayed together. They, they read scripture together. They, they held each other accountable. They, they worshiped together. They served together. And their lives were transformed by Jesus because each of them were going together and trying to follow Jesus as best they could. Their story, their witness proves to us And it's often in the company of others that we grow closest to Christ. Again, our our Methodist historians will know that kind of from that early Oxford Holy Club came the Methodist movement. John and Charles, they saw the power of this. And and so as they revitalized, as a revival happened in the Anglican church in England, they began to create in, in all of these churches, classes, societies, and bands of Methodists who would meet for this purpose, who were committed to Christ and committed to one another. And they would annoy each other to Jesus. This is what a band meeting would look like. It was four or five, maybe six people that would come together and ask the hard questions. A lot like what I think Hebrews is calling us to. Here's a sample of the questions they would ask one another. What known sins have you committed since our last meeting? And each person would go around and answer. What temptations have you met with? How were you delivered? Great to hear how people have been delivered from their sin. What have you thought, said, or done that you're not sure whether or not it was sin? Let's talk about it and discern it together. And then lastly, my favorite question, because it's almost impossible to answer. Have you anything that you desire to keep secret? Yeah. A question to make you think, right? When was the last time someone looked you in the eyes and said, what sins have you committed since the last time I saw you? Maybe never, right? When was the last time you looked into someone's eyes and asked the same question? This is what Hebrews calls us to. This is what it means, what it looks like for us to annoyingly and frustratingly push someone to Christ. To spur them to love and good deeds. One of the fascinating things about the Oxford Holy Club isn't just its existence, but it's the participants. If you actually go and look at the eight or nine people that were a part of it, each of them made an impact on the world. And I mean that. One of the people that participated, we know about John and Charles Wesley because of our Methodist heritage, but another person that was a part of the Oxford Holy Club, you may not realize, was George Whitfield. Um, knew John and Charles Wesley, they were very close early in their life. They later had a disagreement over theological issues, but they always had a deep love and respect for one another because of their time at Oxford. But let me ask you this question. Why is there an entire movement of people called Wesleyans, but not a group of mo- a movement called the Whitfieldians? Right? Because even a- as a Methodist, I'll tell you, George Whitfield was the better preacher. G- go look at anybody who was alive in the 1700s that listened to both of them. They would tell you that George Whitfield was far and away a better preacher than John Wesley. 
I would argue, history seems to indicate that George Whitfield was the best preacher in that day. People by the tens of thousands would come to listen to him. Benjamin Franklin, who, who wouldn't have called himself necessarily a, a Christian, wrote in his own autobiography the importance of George Whitfield on the American colonies. Why are there Wesleyans today and not Whitfieldians today? I think George Whitfield actually gives us the answer. I want to read to you just an, an excerpt of a conversation he had with a gentleman named John Poole. John was friends with both John Wesley and George Whitfield. And so he was asking a, a question. They, they were having a conversation. And this is what George Whitfield remarked. Go in and speak to Mr. John Poole. He says, well, Mr. Poole, art thou still a Wesleyan? Poole replied, yes, sir. And I thank God that I have the privilege of being in connection with him and one of his preachers. John, Whitfield said, thou art in the right place. My brother Wesley acted wisely. The souls that were awakened under his ministry, he joined in classes and bands, and thus preserved the fruits of his labor. This I neglected, and my people are a rope of sand. Trying to follow Jesus without fellow believers beside you is like trying to hold together a rope made of only sand. The slightest breeze or the smallest tug will make it fall apart. You need people and people need you. You need to be in worship. Even when the person next to you is annoying you, you need to be here and perhaps even more so. You need to be in small groups. Even when those people are asking you the tough questions, questions you don't want to think about, questions you won't even ask yourself, you need to be there, and perhaps even more so. You need to be in Bible studies. You need to be in those places where you can dive into the Word together. Even when you get frustrated that they keep calling you over and over and over again because you haven't been there. Perhaps you need to be there even more so. If you want to return to God, you have to return to one another. The life of faith was not designed to be lived alone. Christ wants you to draw near to him. But he knows that to do that, we need to draw close to one another. Don't get in the habit of not meeting together as some have decided to do. And instead, spur one another on, stir up one another to love and good deeds. Because if you want to return to God, you have to return to one another. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, like the author of Hebrews so many years ago, we come first and foremost thankful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. As we read the Gospels, we see all that he has done for us, all that he continues to do. That because of our sinfulness, he came and lived a perfect life so that he might offer himself as a holy and living sacrifice once and for all for the forgiveness of sins. That is why we are here, Lord, and that is why we worship. And so that, that, that might always be ever in front of our eyes, Lord. We have gathered together as a church. You have bound us together by our love of Jesus Christ. Lord, we repent for all of the times that we have not prioritized one another. For all of the times we have been selfish and chosen our own things and our own desires. Your scripture is clear. That to be the body of Christ means to be together. The arm can't survive without the leg. Neither can we survive without our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us, Lord, to shift our priorities, focusing on you and those that are here with us. Call us back to the practice of community. Lord, it's deep within our DNA as Methodists, but it goes back further than that. It's deep within our DNA as followers of you. Help us, O oh Lord, to not forget what it means to be together. For it is in Christ's name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. As we close our time of worship together this morning, I invite us to stand and sing our last song, hymn number 61, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's stand and worship together.
May the cup be a warning to all who try to do it by themselves. We were made to be together. Christ has brought us together as his body. And may we go forth as so. Spurring one another on. Loving one another on. Encouraging one another on to love and good deeds. Go forth this day in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Together all God's people say. Amen. Amen.